Thank you so much for uh, having me. Really great pleasure to be here on such a beautiful day. And thanks so much for uh, coming. Um, so yeah, this is going to be about the role uh, of inequality in macroeconomics. Um, and just to already put it out there, so the main point of my talk uh, is going to be the following. Um, it's that macroeconomics and inequality is uh, sort of a two-way street, by which I mean that uh, they, they interact in the following way. So on the one hand, uh, macroeconomic shocks and policies affect the distribution of income and wealth, so inequality. On the other hand, those distributions matter uh, for uh, the things macroeconomists are traditionally concerned with, which are sort of macroeconomic aggregates. Now, this may kind of sound a little bit obvious to you, but as I'll uh, explain to you, um, this idea sort of only made its way into mainstream macro relatively recently, so like 20 years ago. Uh, I'll talk about this. Um, and then also, uh, lots of people, um, by which I mean economists also, but in particular journalists, um, frequently forget this, um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples of this. Another thing I want to uh, talk about a bit is that um, there seems to me to be, to there to be a, a, a large gap between uh, you know, what's currently going on in academic research in macroeconomics, and I'll try to explain this to you a bit, what's, what's going on there, and you know, how A, uh, people talk about macroeconomics in the media and or blogs and these kind of things, and also, um, and this is I guess our fault a little bit as macroeconomists, um, what we teach to undergraduates, okay? Um, which is sort of uh, from a, a, a while ago. Okay, so now here's the uh, plan of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, for the first half, I'm going to sort of try to give you a bit of a history of thought um, about inequality in macroeconomics. Um, and then I'll uh, talk about one particular application, um, and this is sort of building on some uh, previous work of mine, which is going to be uh, how inequality affects how we should think about a particular type of macroeconomic policy, and I'm going to talk about monetary policy. I should also say, uh, this is sort of based on joint work with lots of people. They're all listed here. I'm not going to read them all. Um, but so this is sort of uh, uh, not just my ideas, but uh, joint work with a lot of other people. OK. So um, let me just uh, sort of dive straight into it. Um, so I, so this is about sort of, I'm, I'm going to try to give you a bit of a history of thought about the role of inequality in macroeconomics. So I personally find it useful. Um, to categorize uh, macroeconomics and in particular macroeconomic theories into sort of three generations, um, sort of starting from the birth of macroeconomics. So macroeconomics, I guess, was sort of born uh, during the Great Recession, uh, sorry, Great Depression, um, and sort of going back to John Maynard Keynes, um, and sort of all the way to the present. And I'm going to sort of try to argue that, uh, that you can think about it for the purpose of the role of inequality in macro, as there being sort of a first generation, which sort of uh, it goes sort of roughly from 1930s, uh, so from the birth of macro to the 1990s, um, then there's sort of maybe a second generation, so that's going to be uh, from 1990 to roughly the financial crisis, um, and then things has been uh, have been changing, I guess, in the in the last sort of 10 years after the financial crisis. Okay. Um, so w one thing I'll also try to convey to you. Um, to also give you an idea about how academic uh, research proceeds in, in this regard, is that sort of the main drivers of this evolution here, I think, are, are, are uh, two or three main things. So the first one is, um, you know, just over the years, we've been getting a lot uh, uh, more data, and in particular, higher quality data. And that's been very, very important, in particular, in terms of uh, incorporating inequality in the way we think about things. Um, the other thing is, you know, computers have gotten better. And that's also important. Um, and then, you know, the, the third one is a little bit obvious. Um, you know, inequality has just been increasing, as everyone know it, knows, at least in, uh, in the US and, and uh, a bunch of other developed countries. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of put more spotlight on that. And then also during the financial crisis, I guess uh, some people have argued there's some things we cannot understand in macroeconomics without thinking about uh, uh, inequality. Okay. So um, let me just. Uh, Go straight there. So this is sort of uh, the, the, the first generation of uh, macroeconomic theories going back to uh, the 1930s. So uh, in particular, this is sort of uh, uh, the, the, this picture here is the so-called Keynesian cross and an IS curve. So just to sort of get a sense of 
how many people have seen this at some point before, maybe in their undergrads or something like that? Yeah, okay, so there's a, there's people have, okay, good. Um, so, you know, um, this, this fun curve, curve shifting stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this Keynesian cross here, consumption feeds back into income, feeds back into consumption, and so you get this kind of multiplier uh, there. Um, uh, the, the other type of theories that were there mostly uh, pre-1930, um, uh, sorry, pre-1990, were uh, uh, these kind of models here. In particular, uh, models like, I'll, I'll explain this a bit more detail in a second, there's this uh, thing called real business cycle theory. Um, and in, in general, other type of uh, representative agent models. So prior to 1990, uh, people either did sort of this Keynesian um, ISLM stuff, uh, so, you know, which are typically sort of systems of equations and aggregate variables. You can solve them somehow for thinking about how, how the macroeconomy functions. Or they do uh, something a little bit different, um, but sort of uh, related in some sense, which is they work with these so-called representative agent models where the simplifying assumption that's being made is sort of that everyone in the economy is the same, okay? Um, which, you know, it sounds a bit crazy uh, b because it is. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit. And then, you know, the kind of, uh, the, the models are kind of nice in the sense because they're, they're, they're micro-founded, so they build on, on, on microeconomic behavior, but they make this very strong assumption that everyone's the same. And then, you know, using these kind of models, you can explain aggregate time series. So this is just an example of some simulation of, of something that comes out of that. So there's some, something that drives the, uh, the, the business cycle here, which in this case are productivity shocks. You, you can explain something that looks like a time series for aggregate GDP um, and so on. Okay, now, um, the, the, this, the first two points I've, I've, I've already said. So these models in particular, these real business cycle models, and there's also other uh, representative agent models uh, which are known as new Keynesian models. So they're kind of like uh, these representative agent real business cycle models, but with uh, taking on board this Keynesian idea that prices are sticky, okay, um, and they're a little bit more interesting, but they all have a representative agent in the background. Um, and, you know, these models, at, at least currently, they're, they're still very heavily used, not so much in academic research, but in particular by policymakers, in particular at central banks, okay. At central banks, these theories are pretty much sort of the only game in town, um, and the only theories or models that uh, say uh, the research is used to, to give to the, in the US, the Federal Open Markets Committee uh, before they meet to, to make predictions about the future. And now, if you, you know, thought about this maybe a little bit on the, on the previous slide, um, in, in both of these models, in, on, in both of these types of theories, so these systems of equations, these ISLM type models, and or, uh, you know, uh, these, these representative agent models, they're kind of obviously, there's sort of no role for inequality by assumption, okay? Particular, it's, it's particularly obvious in the representative agent model uh, where, you know, that everyone is the same, so you can't have inequality, obviously. Now, um, you know, uh, why, why did we proceed from that? Um, sort of what's, or what's maybe wrong with these uh, uh, first generation theories, as I called them? Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of debate about this, so there's a lot wrong with these kind of theories. Um, uh, but for the purpose of, of today, let's just talk about inequality in macroeconomics, and I want to focus on two things. So the, the first thing is uh, kind of an obvious uh, one, which is they cannot speak to a number of important things uh, we've seen in the data, in particular about the distribution of income and, and wealth. I'll show you some important ones in a second. Um, and then the other thing, and I'll come back to this, is that you cannot think coherently about well-being and welfare of a country really uh, when you ignore a distribution, right? Um, because, you know, it, it, these things matter, and I'll, I'll get back to that again. Okay, now here's uh, two examples of uh, things that you cannot think about uh, uh, with a representative agent model or, or with, a, with a model like the ones I've, I've shown you that doesn't have a role for, uh, for inequality. So this is uh, from a recent paper um, here by uh, Piketty, Saez, and Zygman. Um, and, you know, this is sort of, they're not the first to make this point, um, but, but they make it kind of nicely. So the, the, the point they're just making is that, you know, in the long run, this is about the U.S. The U.S. economy has kind of grown pretty steadily um, since the uh, uh, war at sort of roughly 2% per year, okay? But, um, you know, this growth has been very unequally distributed, okay? So uh, what, what the graph is showing is uh, two series. 
And so time on the x-axis um, and on the y-axis are two series. So on the left axis, axis is the, uh, the share of national income that has gone uh, to the, to the uh, top 1% or just the amount of national income, sorry, that has gone to the top 1%. So that's the, the red line. Um, and on the right axis is the uh, uh, share of, uh, so the white dots is the share of, uh, sorry, the, the amount of income that has gone to the bottom 50% of the distribution, which is, I mean, obviously a much bigger group. And what you can see is that basically, um, while, uh, you know, income at the bottom has basically roughly stagnated since the uh, 1970s, so it's really completely flat. You can see here in, in 2014, the, the level is kind of the same as in the 1970s, the, the white line, uh, income is at the top have increased a lot, okay? So, you know, maybe we want to think about this. Um, obviously, if you have a model that doesn't have a distribution and inequality in it, you cannot even think about that, okay? Here's another fact um, that seems to ask for like a, a role of distributions in macroeconomics um, and that you cannot think about with these first generation models, which is that um, at least in the US, but I think it's similar for other countries as well, um, tends to be the case that in a recession, uh, the bottom of the distribution is typically hit hardest, okay? So uh, what's in this graph, so again, it's time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is some sort of measure of uh, income, um, and here's some sort of various moments of the uh, income distribution. So in particular, the, the blue line here is, say, the 10th percentile of the income distribution, so this is the income of someone relatively low down in the income distribution, and then there's some other percentiles so, for example, the black line up here is the 95th percentile and so on. And you can sort of see two things in this graph. So the first thing is that it fans out, right? Um, so that's just a well-known fact that uh, inequality has been increasing over time in the U.S. Um, but then there's a more subtle thing, which is kind of interesting, which is, um, so the, the green things here, um, those are uh, recessions, okay? In particular, in the U.S., the way it works, there's a... a business cycle dating committee, right? So they, there's a committee that says the recession started on this date and it ended on this date. So that's, that's, that's what it is. Um, and you know, what you can see is that basically in these recessions, so these shaded areas, uh, the top of the distribution get, hits harder, get, get hit hardest. And um, so in particular, the inequality seems to be quite stable in expansions. So whenever it's not shaded, but then in the recession, so here's an extreme one, um, you know, the distribution fans out and it's kind of stable afterwards. So again, this is something that, you know, maybe you, you'd want to think about um, uh, and so on. Now, uh, let me sort of say some related things and, you know, appeal to higher authority. Um, so this is uh, two quotes uh, that make sort of similar points by two uh, uh, Nobel laureates. Um, so the, the first one is just kind of making an obvious point. So this is James Heckman at the University of Chicago, who uh, in his Nobel lecture, this is already in 2001, sort of said, uh, the most important discovery um, of his career, I guess, in economics, was the evidence on the pervasiveness of uh, heterogeneity and diversity in economic life. So maybe, again, one of these things that kind of sounds obvious, um, but, but I mean, it's sort of important to think about. And the other one is a little bit more subtle, um, and this is uh, from my colleague Angus Deaton um, uh, from his 2016 Nobel lecture. So he says, you know, uh, while we must often focus on, uh, on ag aggregates for macroeconomic policy, and now comes the important part, it is impossible to think coherently about national well-being while ignoring inequality and poverty, neither of which is visible in aggregate data. So the idea here, right, is just very simply that, you know, giving Bill Gates an extra $100 is very different from giving someone poor an extra $100, and you know, therefore, you need to take this, these distributions into account if you want to think about welfare, okay? Now, um, this brings us then to sort of uh, the next generation of macro theories um, that tried to make some progress in this and, and you know, tried to take this on board. So the second generation here, in particular, sort of starting in the 1990s, started to, you know, Get, get, get rid of this uh, friendly fellow here, the, the, the representative agent, and, you know, uh, try to think about some heterogeneity. So here, I mean, I'm representing this with these different people of different colors. Um, but the idea is really that, you know, in a lot of things, uh, in, in microdata, you see a lot of heterogeneity. In particular, 
um, in, as we all know, uh, income and wealth, okay? And, you know, these, these new theories kind of started uh, taking that on, on board. And the rough idea is that rather than, you know, thinking about a, the macroeconomy in terms of these macroeconomic aggregates, you know, like just like one number, um, like GDP or capital or so on, you try to think about it in terms of a distribution, okay? Here's a, uh, some, some, some uh, graph I took from some paper, uh, which, which uh, the, the idea would be that you now, now you have uh, a distribution, say, of wealth and of income, and here this is uh, this nice rainbow colored thing is, uh, you know, the, the, some joint distribution over these. Um, so you can see sort of it's skewed in the sense that there's few wealthy people, uh, but relatively uh, many uh, poor people. Um, and you know, the idea is to have, uh, to, to think about the macroeconomy as a distribution that in particular sort of may move over time, okay, um, and, you know, responds to uh, macroeconomic shocks and policies, okay, which really is a fundamentally different vision from, like, these old, old generation type of models, okay. Um, so just to, you know, tell you a little bit about the literature, so, uh, you know, to contrast these, these theories with these, this nice representative agent uh, type models up here, these theories uh, uh, sort of... Uh, Quite sometimes somewhat obviously uh, often referred to as heterogeneous Asian models, okay, as opposed to representative Asian models. And, you know, here's, here's a list of some important uh, contributions to this, this literature. And this, this was sort of started in, in the 1990s. Okay. Now, the, these, these theories are great um, uh, because in particular, they can uh, potentially talk to these kind of facts I've told you about, which is that, you know, growth in the long run is unequally distributed and, you know, uh, the, the bottom of the distribution is hit hardest in recessions. And uh, in particular, this is the Deaton quote, you can think about uh, the welfare implications of these kind of distributional changes. Okay. Now, it uh, turns out, and this is kind of the interesting twist, um, that these, these second generation type theories from the 1990s had the feature that you have uh, macroeconomic stuff affecting the distribution, but sort of not the other way around. Okay. Um, so in particular, there's no role sort of for inequality in terms of understanding what happens to the whole of the distribution. So here's a, uh, uh, some, some points to make this to more precise. So the second generation theories, now they have all this distribution, but sort of typically the finding was that there's kind of small effects of taking this heterogeneity or this inequality seriously um, for, uh, you know, macroeconomic aggregates. So the idea is, you know, suppose you're like a hardcore macroeconomist and you say, I don't care about the distribution. Um, uh, I only care about what happens to GDP, um, you know, the capital stock investment and so on. Um, and then the idea was that, well, th these, these theories to a certain extent kind of told you you can kind of just forget about the, the distribution and inequality. So here's a, here's a summary uh, uh, about this literature, about the state of literature in 2000, roughly 2003 here by uh, Bob Lucas. Um, and, you know, he said that uh, for determining the behavior of aggregates, so the stuff macroeconomists typically care about. So that's uh, this, this paper by Cusell Smith, which was one of the second generation papers, um, discovered that realistically modeled heterogeneity just does not matter very much, okay? Um, so at, in contrast, and this was uh, the point I, I, I made before, at the same time, of course, you know, for individual behavior and welfare, uh, heterogeneity is everything. But, you know, if you just want to understand GDP, you don't have to worry about this. Now, what's the reason for this? And this is sort of uh, uh, a little bit technical, but I, I wanted to kind of make it, try to make it intuitive. So the idea here is that in these second generation theories, the, the rich and poor people differ in, say, their income and their wealth, but, you know, they don't really differ in their consumption and savings behavior, okay? In particular, the rich um, in these kind of theories tend to be just kind of scaled versions of poor people, okay? As in, like, in particular, they'll have sort of the same savings and consumption rates, um, and and uh, it's, it's just, so the level is higher, but the fractions are kind of the same, okay? Now, uh, just to, I'll, 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 this is sort of an aside, just to be fair to literature, so there's sort of some notable exceptions from the same time, uh, uh, you know, where inequality does affect uh, the, the macroeconomy. There's some contributions here. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this for too much. Uh, these are mostly about sort of long-run growth in developing countries, so I'm, uh, uh, not business cycles, and they're typically very abstract, so they're kind of hard to take the data, so I'm not going to talk about this too much. Okay. So now, 
why did we sort of get rid of the second generation theories or what's, what's, what's wrong with these? Um, so the problem with these, and you may have anticipated this given what I said on the previous slide, uh, you know, these generations don't really square very well with what we know about consumption and savings behavior uh, in microeconomic data, okay? Um, so for example, um, there's a lot of evidence on uh, what's called uh, marginal propensities to consume um, out of transitory income changes across the wealth distribution. So the idea is like, if I give you $100, uh, how many dollars of it are you gonna consume and how many are you gonna save, okay? And basically what you find in data, okay, it's also maybe not so surprising, um, these, the fraction of the, uh, these $100 that you, uh, people consume uh, declines with wealth, okay? Particularly here's a, uh, with some measure of liquid wealth, okay? So, um, you know, rich people, if you give Bill Gates $100, he, we, he will, I don't know, maybe just eat one dollar of it and save the rest. And, you know, if you give someone poor who's like living hand to mouth a hundred dollars, he's going to eat a lot more of this. It's sort of intuitively obvious. Now, the, the way the theories work, um, they kind of have this a little bit, okay? But they typically only have it at the very, very bottom of the distribution, okay? But then some, someone who's like at the 10th or 20th percentile of the distribution is going to more or less behave like Bill Gates, okay? And that's kind of a problem. Um, there's some uh, similar fact about uh, uh, savings rates. Okay, this is very related. So in, in these second generation models, um, you know, uh, savings rates um, as a function of where you are in the wealth distribution, so this is percentile of net worth um, on the uh, x-axis are kind of roughly basically uh, constant across the wealth distribution. Uh, in the data, this is not what you see, so this is from some a recent work of mine, so we have some Norwegian data, so the Scandinavians always have this awesome uh, administrative data. So uh, we're looking at saving rates across the wealth distribution. You actually find that it's, so the, the right-hand thing is maybe the more intuitive one. So you find that on the right-hand of the wealth distribution, savings rates are increasing. So, uh, you know, richer people save a larger fraction of their income. Kind of makes sense. Um, and at the bottom is actually kind of decreasing for reasons I, I'll discuss some other time. Um, so, you know, it's just the idea the, the two don't square, okay? Now, um, in, a, in a way, uh, so what's wrong with the second generation theory? So this is a, a, the Steeton quote again, the first part I've already read to you. Um, there's also a second part to the quote, okay? The second part basically says that, um, you, know, uh, you know, so focusing on aggregates, uh, you know, you can't do, and, and the second part then says, you know, indeed, and except in exceptional cases, macroeconomic aggregates de themselves depend on distribution, which I just told you the, the second generation theories don't capture. And the idea is basically that the second generation models are exactly sort of this exceptional cases, um, where because everything kind of scales, um, and rich people are kind of just scaled versions of poor people, and um, distribution doesn't matter. Okay, so now this uh, uh, brings me to these, uh, the, the sort of most recent generation of theories, um, which I'm going to call here the the third generation theories, and this is sort of really taken, a literature has really taken off uh, after the crisis. So here, uh, I've borrowed something from a very nice speech by uh, uh, Janet Yellen uh, called Macroeconomic Research After Crisis. You can look it up online, like all uh, Federal Reserve speeches. And um, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of read it to you with a little bit of comments. So, you know, she, she has sort of what are the main priorities of, of research in macroeconomics um, and or the main developments. Um, and she sort of says, my second question asks uh, whether individual differences within broad groups of actors in the economy can influence aggregate economic outcomes. Uh, and here's the more precise one. In particular, what effect does such heterogeneity, so in particular in income and wealth, say, have on aggregate demand? Okay. Um, which, again, in the, in the first generation theories, you can't even think about. In the second generation theories, the answer is like basically nothing, okay? even though you can think about it. Um, and, you know, she says, okay, this we've already talked about. So prior to the financial crisis, representative Asian models were the dominant paradigm for analyzing uh, many macroeconomic questions. Um, however, uh, uh, a disaggregated approach seems needed to understand some key aspects of the Great Recession. To give one example, um, consider the effects of negative housing equity on consumption. So, you know, she, she, so what happened in the financial crisis in particular is that a lot of people basically in the US, their, their housing equity got wiped out just because house prices fell. And you see uh, that affecting 
uh, 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 consumption. Um, in particular, you see it uh, affecting consumption uh, more so if people basically sort of lose their entire equity than if they just lose some part, okay? So that they may have to default on their mortgage, okay? Um, and, you know, she says this is something you cannot think about with think without thinking about heterogeneity. And uh, this is kind of the main point I wanted to get to. So uh, she says, while the economics profession has long been uh, aware that these issues matter, their effects had been incorporated into macro models only to a very limited extent prior to financial crisis. So th she's talking here about the, the second generation models. And now she says, well, I'm very glad to see, uh, now see a greater emphasis on the possible macroeconomic consequences of uh, such heterogeneity. And this is, I guess, what I'm going to talk about. Okay, now just to give you a sense of what these uh, uh, theories look like. Um, so the idea is basically that these new theories take uh, more seriously what we see in microdata, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, these third generation theories, if you want, um, in particular, try to match what we know about household balance sheets, so the different assets you hold, you know, do you hold normal or real assets, do you hold liquid assets, like you all, do you have all your, bank, uh, your money in a, in, a, in a savings account, or do you um, have all your money in a house or like a private business, something that's very illiquid, okay? You think that maybe matters. Um, and in particular, they uh, uh, try to, um, you know, uh, generate something we've seen in the data before, which is marginal propensities to consume um, that are relatively high on average. Um, so people on average, if you give them $100, kind of consume 30 of it, okay? Which is very different from the, the predictions of these old models. Um, and then also there's a lot of heterogeneity um, in these. So this is some exa uh, an example from uh, a paper I've been working on, and just to give you a sense of what comes out of this. Um, and you know, the idea is that, so this is the distribution of marginal propensities to consume in one of these uh, uh, theories. Um, so the, the way uh, you, you generate this, and you have basically and sort of going from zero to one, one is a high MPC and zero is a low MPC, and you have a bunch of people that have very high MPCs uh, much higher than, than, than you have uh, in these old models and consistent with microdata. Um, this nice 3D graph, I think I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, go fast on. So the, the idea is that wh where these MPCs are high, in particular, depends on household balance sheets. Okay, so, so here on this axis is liquid wealth, and uh, here's illiquid wealth, so say how much housing wealth you have, how much is in your bank account. And it tends to be the case both in the data and in this particular theory that, you know, MPCs are high for people with low liquid wealth, okay? In particular, even if people maybe have uh, a lot of uh, illiquid wealth, okay? So these are uh, some people uh, in, in these theories and in the data that we call sort of the wealthy hand-to-mouth guys, by which we mean um, people who uh, sort of are rich on paper, uh, but even though they're rich on paper, they kind of behave as they're poor, okay? So the idea is like, you know, if you recently bought a house and you took out a mortgage and you put all your liquid wealth into your house, then maybe you're gonna behave a little bit similar to someone who's poor if I give you like $100 and indeed this is something you, you, you see in the data. Okay. So, um, just uh, let me, you know, I tell you sort of roughly um, some concrete mechanisms through which inequality could affect the macroeconomy um, and that people have uh, thought about to differing uh, extents. So in, in roughly, um, you, I think, can split these reasons into three types of reasons. So, uh, uh, demand side reasons, I'm going to call them. Supply side reasons, I'm going to call them. And uh, maybe sort of political economy reasons. These ones I'm not going to dwell on too much because that's not necessarily just macro. That's more political economy, I guess. But uh, I'm going to spend most of the time on this. Okay. So here's some uh, demand side reasons. And I kind of already uh, said these things. So the demand side reasons would be that the thing that Yellen was referring to, right, that the aggregate demand in the economy, so how much people consume, depends on the distribution of income. And one very simple reason for this would be, uh, you know, just that uh, uh, rich people um, spend a smaller fraction of their income than poor people. Um, and therefore, uh, you could have this kind of mechanical effect that an increase in inequality causes lower consumer spending. Uh, uh, there's more subtle versions of this story. Um, the, like the one I just uh, alluded to. For example, it may not just matter whether you're rich. It may ma matter more like how your household balance sheets are composed, okay? In particular, do you have uh, a lot of liquid assets or liquid assets? And in particular, it may be that really the people we, 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 we should care about or that have the high MPCs are the, the liquid wealth rich rather than just the rich on, on, on paper. 
Um, so the people with a house, so houses don't uh, count toward liquid wealth. They, they, they may have a high uh, MPC as well. Um, on the, on a, uh, another thing is uh, the, the thing that uh, Yellen also kind of talked about was, you know, stories that emphasize what happens to housing and mortgages. Um, if you look at, you know, the kind of wealth people have in the data, Housing, housing is usually like one of the biggest things in, in the data, and so that seems like obvious and important to think about. There's also some supply side stories. So right by, by uh, these are sort of used in the traditional macro sense. Demand side means basically consumption and investment. Um, supply here means just how production is organized. Um, so here's, here's one example. Um, so you know, credit constraints in education. Um, could be uh, uh, make inequality matter basically. So poor children, um, you know, tend to get an inferior education even if they're talented, um, and uh, you know that may be bad for long-run growth. Um, similarly, you could have uh, credit constraints in entrepreneurship, which will uh, make the wealth distribution matter for who enters entrepreneurship. Okay. So the idea is, uh, if you're a smart but poor entrepreneur, you may not be able to get a loan from a bank, um, and you know if you're a uh, if you're a rich but stupid entrepreneur, you may still get a loan, okay? <laughs> so then uh, that would be suboptimal um, because you obviously want the smart people to, to run stuff. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, you know, the regulation and so on uh, 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 may actually kind of go the opposite way in which uh, uh, you may actually observe growth and inequality both raising at the same time. The final thing, this is, uh, I'm not going to dwell on too much, I think it's kind of interesting um, uh, in, if you think about current events a little bit, um, so it would be that this idea, and there's some papers on this, that sort of too much inequality leads sort of to revolution. Okay, it doesn't have to be revolution in the literal sense of the word. It can just also be Donald Trump getting elected. Okay. Okay. Um, the general thing I want to uh, say here is that you know, there's a bunch of different mechanisms. Theory in general makes no clear prediction whether sort of inequality is good or bad for macro. Okay, it's more the general thing I want to get across is that um, you know that the distribution matters or like how stuff is distributed matters. Okay, and this is now we take on board. So here's a summary again of this uh, of this intellectual uh, or uh, history of thought. Um, so again, the the first generation models from sort of 1930 to 1990. They really had no role uh, for inequality by assumption, these uh, old Keynesian or RBC type models. And new Keynesian models, which are a bit more recent, kind of fall also in this uh, category. And um, the second generation models, you know, they kind of have a distribution. They take inequality seriously, but they only have a one-way street, so from macro to inequality, but not from inequality to macro. Um, and now we kind of have these more rich models that take microdata seriously, and they have a rich interaction between inequality and, and macro. And I'll give you a, a bit of a more uh, particular example when I talk about monetary policy in a second. Okay. So what's driving this evolution? I've already alluded to this. Um, so first, better data. Second, better computers. Third, current events. So here's some uh, things to think about. So, you know, uh, better data, what do I mean by that? In particular, there's been an explosion of, uh, uh, of the availability of high quality microdata, um, which you've probably seen a, a bunch of in this lecture series. Um, so in particular, they, there's now these big, nice administrative data sets um, for places such as the Internal Revenue Services or US Tax Authority or the Social Security Administration. Or in Scandinavia, they have these really nice data sets too. Uh, in particular, in, in, in Norway, where they have a wealth tax, so you have wealth data, administrative data. Um, and this is very useful for macroeconomics um, because, you know, in general, you're going to need large samples um, to document fine-grained heterogeneity, particularly since distributions tend to be uh, very skewed, so meaning there's a lot of inequality at the, at the very top of the distribution. Okay? To really capture what the top 1 or top 0.1% of the wealth distribution do, you kind of need this kind of administrative data. <coughs> okay. um, the other thing is that... You know, it does, I think, rely a bit on, you know, how, how good we are at computing stuff. So in the end, the way, you, uh, the, the way you solve the first generation models, at least the simple ones, kind of, was kind of on pencil and paper. Um, not the big ones. The ones that the Fed have, they also solve it with computers. But they're just system of equations, so it's pretty simple. Um, the, the models with heterogeneity, because you have to keep track of a distribution, are much harder to solve. Okay, and I guess to a certain extent you just couldn't do this in like 1930 or 1950 or whatever. Um, now, uh, it's also the case that, you know, the third generation models where sort of inequality really matters for the macro aggregates are also harder to solve than the second generation ones. So that, I do think this is sort of the, the natural, uh, you know, evolution of things there with computer power. Then finally, um, you know, current events seem to be important. 
And you know, this I've already said, you know, inequality rises. And this is was Yellen's point, sort of you cannot understand some key aspects of the Great Recession, for example, without thinking about heterogeneity. Now, uh, let me skip this. This was some, some example of, of better data, um, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip this. So I want to make one sort of a little bit of a side point, which I thought may be interesting for this audience. So I think the, the way that uh, media talk about macroeconomics and also the ways undergraduate macro is taught is kind of stuck pre before 1990, okay? Um, and in particular, they're almost con exclusively concerned with these first generation theories in which there's no role for inequality by assumption. So here's an example. So media um, often criticize macroeconomists for ignoring heterogeneity. I don't know if, who's, if anyone ever came across that criticism. I, I, you see it a lot if you kind of watch out for it. But here's an article I, I just Googled around a bit from like uh, 11 days ago, okay, from Reuters and has this very polemic uh, way of writing, the, the, the gentleman who wrote this. So he says, you know, the preference for high theory and abstruse mathematical modeling meant that mainstream economics had come to rest on a number of gloriously improbable assumptions. Uh, in their model, millions of households were reduced to a single representative agent, a godlike, omniscient, and immortal. This unreal creature inhabited a world where peace or equilibrium ruled, crises were impossible, and such. Okay, he goes on for a while. Um, <laughs> If you read this kind of stuff, this is simply a wildly inaccurate description of what's going on in academic macroeconomics, at least after the end of the 1990s, okay? Yeah, you can say you can criticize a lot macro for a lot of stuff, but not for this, okay? This is kind of absurd. Um, the only point um, where uh, I think this guy may have a point, and this is maybe uh, also where, where, where the uh, impression is generated, is... Um, this, this idea that macroeconomists ignore heterogeneity um, actually applies to undergraduate teaching, okay? Because, in particular, the stuff that undergrads typically learn, and that's why I kind of asked people before, are exactly these old Keynesian ISLM type models um, with a Keynesian cross, okay? Where you cannot think about inequality um, and, and by, by assumption ignores uh, uh, in, uh, heterogeneity. Same is true for these uh, RBC type models, which sometimes are also taught. But, you know, for some reason, this is somehow not on the syllabi because it's hard, harder, but, you know, this is really what's going on these days uh, in a lot of macro, okay? There's some people making sort of similar points. Okay, let me skip this because I'm noticing I'm running low on time. There's a few slides to tell you that cross-country regressions are probably not uh, particularly useful for thinking about uh, inequality in macro, at least that's what most economists say. But let me just talk about the, the monetary uh, uh, policy stuff. So this is an example of where I think uh, inequality changes sort of uh, uh, quite a bit how we th think about uh, macroeconomic policy. Okay? And, and this is the case of monetary policy. This is uh, you know, building on some, um, some work of mine with two co-authors, uh, Greg Kaplan and Gianluca Violante. Um, and we kind of proposing this framework for thinking about uh, monetary policy, which we kind of a bit, uh, uh, you know, um, cheek in hand call uh, HANK, um, which stands sort of for a heterogeneous agent, new Keynesian model, um, which I told you what a heterogeneous agent model is. New Keynesian models are basically the models that uh, central banks use uh, to think about monetary policy. Um, and the goal is uh, to introduce heterogeneity into these models. Um, and, you know, to, to kind of make fun of it, um, we uh, 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 like to uh, sort of uh, call these existing models that the, re re that the central banks uh, use RANK, which I guess here sort of is the acronym for representative agent uh, new Keynesian model. Just happen happens to be RANK. Okay. Um, now, let me just explain to you a little bit how this works. So the starting point here is basically how monetary policy works in uh, most of the models that are used by central banks. Um, and uh, this, is, this is how it works. So if the central bank so cuts uh, real interest rates, what basically happens, so the, the uh, consumption uh, goes up, okay? So that kind of doesn't sound so crazy. But the way it happens in these models is kind of crazy, okay? So the, the idea is that basically when the central bank cuts interest rates, then all of, all of you guys, you're going to... Uh, you know, 
look at the interest rate, and you're going to see, oh, like it's like 25 basis points lower. So I'm going to uh, better like, so the return on my savings is lower, so I'm going to better save less um, and you know, borrow more, and therefore I'm going to increase my consumption. Okay? Um, and that's, that's basically almost all the story. And then there's only some very small sort of multiplier <laughs> effects whereby uh, you know, aggregate demand increases and income increases. Okay? Um, the problem with this is that um, it's kind of not particularly realistic if you think about uh, microeconomic data. In particular, it doesn't seem to be the case that in data people respond very strongly to interest rate changes with sort of one exception, which is like if you're going to buy a house and you're going to look at the mortgage or something like that. Uh, but other than that, I mean, I, you can ask yourself, like, do you follow like, what exactly the interest rates are at all times of time? Probably not so much. Okay? Um, instead, what you do uh, follow and presumably have a pretty good idea about and determines also your consumption is what your income is. Okay? Um, and uh, the, the problem with this is that in the existing models, this is exactly the reverse. Okay? People respond very strongly to inter interest rate changes, but not to income changes. The final thing is that, you know, in, these, uh, uh, in the data, there's typically a lot of heterogeneity I've already talked about. Okay. Now, the idea is that basically um, what we do is we propose a different theory where we basically take seriously this micro evidence and um, we, we basically, just the things I just told you about, we're going to have a, a theory where basically people don't respond so much to interest rate changes, but they do respond to income changes. Now, uh, one interesting thing is that Sort of, it starts to look a little bit, uh, it's kind of related to the old sort of Keynesian cross you may remember from your undergrad, at least in the terms of the logic, but you still have this distribution and you can think about the distribution um, and you know, the, the relative importance of these direct and indirect effects uh, is, is, is completely reversed. So people you know, respond a lot to income changes, but not to interest rate changes. Now, um, let me skip this. Just <coughs> say one more thing here on this, um, which is, one implication of this, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting to mention here, is that you know, the way it works in the standard uh, models that the people at central banks use, it has this view of the world where the central banks are super powerful um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, controlling consumption, at least sort of in normal times. There's sort of this thing called the zero lower bound, uh, which, which some people think we're at. But you know, in normal times, central banks are very powerful. So as soon as they manage to lower interest rates, people are just going to respond very strongly in terms of increasing consumption. Um, the interesting thing in these kind of alternative theories is that um, you know, this is just not longer true. Instead, what has to happen is that monetary policy works through these kind of indirect effects. Okay? It has to be the case that somehow you know, investment responds um, and that then translates into higher income for people or you know, it matters what fiscal policy does, and so on. Just all a lot more subtle, and you may either get a small response of consumption to interest rate cuts or a, a large one, depending on all sorts of stuff. Okay, so let me, I think, uh, kind of uh, conclude. I have a bit too many slides. I guess they're gonna be on the website. You can look at that. Um, there's also some interesting stuff about the, the uh, uh, distributional consequences. So let me just conclude with this slide here. Um, so, what I tried to convey is that um, sort of macroeconomics and inequality, again, is this sort of a, a, a two-way street. So on the one hand, inequality uh, uh, affects macroeconomic aggregates. On the other hand, uh, macro shocks and policies affect the distribution of stuff. And you know, what's actually happening uh, uh, a lot is that current research in macroeconomics um, takes this seriously. I have, a, in the end of the slides, I have like you know, 20 citations to, or, or 32 papers that do this. Um, and in particular, they tend to incorporate the uh, enormous heterogeneity that we see uh, in the mic at the micro level, in particular in, in income and wealth. Okay? And doing so often tells you that, you know, uh, gives you a very different picture of how the, how the, how the world works, in particular how uh, monetary and fiscal policies work. And you know, the other nice thing is you can think about the distributional implication. So for example, you know, if, you, if you cut interest rates, um, that presumably has kind of large distributional effects. So for example, cutting interest rates is typically bad for people uh, who, who are savers, like pensioners, I guess, maybe. And uh, uh, it's, it's good for people who borrow, and you maybe want to take that into account. All right, that's it. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'm happy to take some questions, I guess.